All right. As people are trickling in right now, hello and welcome back, everyone from the holidays. I hope everyone had a wonderful time and a safe time. Thank you so much for joining us today and kicking off the year with our very first Business Bites of 2021. My name is Brian from Hannah House, Newport Beach. If you are new to Business Bites, we are pleased to have you here today. Business Bites is a collaboration between Hannah House and Onyx Access. Onyx Access is an innovation and consulting firm and Hannah House is a flexible co-working space and cafe in two locations, Palo Alto and Newport Beach. Our space is currently closed due to pandemic, but we continue to operate and provide many insightful and free events every month. Please follow both of our social medias to stay updated in all our situations. We have an amazing session today uh, to start off the new year. It will be recorded and sent to you via email and also uploaded to our Hannah House YouTube channel. We encourage you all to use the chat box to ask any questions, engage with the community. Uh, but we also want to emphasize that this is a safe space. With a lot of the recent events happening, we want to keep everything very respectful with our community and appreciate that from everyone. So at the end of the session, we'll send out a survey to let us know how we can improve our sessions in the future. So without further ado, I'm gonna get everything started and head it over to Shelly from Audix Access as today's moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Han House, for co-hosting this virtual Business Bite series in collaboration with On Its Axis. Happy New Year to all of you participating with us. I hope it's not too late in the month to still wish you a happy and safe New Year. Um, and if you're in attendance here or listening to the live recording, uh, which will be provided um, the next few days, we appreciate you joining us today. We're truly excited to keep the momentum going in 2021 bringing incredible thought leaders to share insights on the topics of innovation, leadership, business development, and more. I'm truly grateful to be facilitating today's session. Today, we have three successful thought leaders contributing their time and sharing their thoughts on our topic, anticipating disruption, how authentic customer engagement keeps you ahead of the competition. Paul, Phyllis, Brandon, welcome to Business Bites, and thank you for spending your time with us today. Let's take a moment to have you introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your roles. Uh, let's start with Paul. We'll go Paul, Phyllis, Brandon. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with this group. Um, I'm Paul Stovall, Senior VP of Worldwide Sales and Customer Success at Telesign. Um, uh, lead the customer facing teams at Telesign. Um, so that consists of uh, world class teams in market development, which is inside sales for us, customer success, field sales and channel sales, and, and then obviously uh, worldwide sales operations. Um, teams uh, almost at about 100 uh, in total. Um, we've been super fortunate to, uh, to be successful during the pandemic as digital transformation has really sped ahead. Um, and so I guess my last part of my role is, is being chief cheerleader, um, you know, very difficult times these days and just trying to be, you know, there for our employees and be empathetic to what's going on and, and know that we have their support. Um, so again, thank you for having me. And hi, I'm Phyllis Olson from Chicago. I come to you with a consulting background and lots of professional services over 25 years of experience leading professional services teams, e-commerce product management, customer success teams. And my focus has really always been on delivering business value to customers. I'm currently a director of customer success at Salesforce, uh, which if you don't know is the fastest growing enterprise technology company with $21 billion in revenue. We're number one for CRM customer engagement center. We're also a lead in field service management and Salesforce automation according to Gartner. We've got a ton of solutions, including digital marketing, e-commerce, analytics, integrations, learning systems, partner relationship management solutions, AI, among others. And in my role in customer success, my team and I are responsible for a portfolio of enterprise level customers and helping them get the maximum ROI out of the products that they already own. So they may talk to a lot of Salesforce people representing all of their various products throughout the day. And I sometimes joke with them that from me and my team, we're the ones that aren't going to try to sell them anything. 
Hi, I'm Brandon. I want to thank HANA House and on its axis for inviting us to join this panel. Uh, full disclosure, I have biked down to the Newport Beach HANA House and gone in it, so I am familiar with how awesome it is, and I'm waiting for everything to open back up. Haven't tried the coffee there yet, but it's on my list. Uh, quick, quick about me, I'm a Florida State grad, and I've spent my entire life trying to be a avoid being labeled Florida man. So I will, I will try that this year as well. <laughs> Not show up on the news as Florida man. I am a US Army veteran and I have a master's in business. Uh, as you can tell from my gray hair, this is my third decade of customer experience and employee experience. I started off, my hair was dark brown. Uh, throughout my career, whether it's uh, technical service and support, software development, user experience, it's all been around customer experience around CX and employee experience EX. I've been a practitioner uh, both in-house as an outsourcer, I've been a consultant, I've uh, been a vendor, but that focus is always CX and EX. So if you like more of my current role, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. You guys are incredible. You have such amazing experience and you bring such um, energy and enthusiasm to this conversation. So audience members, Feel free to post in the chat any questions that you have and make sure to connect um, if you wish uh, with our panelists. So let's dive into today's conversation. So we know companies focus on customer experience. They always reduce churn, they increase revenues, and it often leads to higher profits. Yet successfully navigating this landscape and creating a, creating a sustainable model that delivers high customer engagement is very challenging. In your opinion, can authentic customer engagement help companies avoid disruption? If so, how? I'm sorry, I read the wrong question. <laughs> Welcome to 2021. All right, let's go back. The word disruption has become a buzzword in recent years, prompting many Silicon Valley execs to recommend its retirement suggesting the word itself has become so pervasive it's lost its meaning, yet it remains an important part of business nomenclature. From your experience, what is disruption and why are business leaders concerned with it? Phyllis, can you start us off? Sure. I, in my view, disruption is innovation that hits the marketplace to fill a customer's need, and sometimes it's a need that they didn't even know they had. Um, you know, these products, services as well, can hit the space seemingly out of left field at times and then end up displacing competing products. So I'm sure that we can all think of a product that you didn't know you needed, that you didn't know existed. Um, I am thinking of one right now because I've just, like many people in during COVID working from home, I've just bought a new house on Friday. And um, in order to get ready, I've been using a company called MakeSpace to come and pick up all my junk from the old house and store it. And then they'll bring it back to me when I need it. Um, so most people are driving their Christmas tree and things like that over to their storage unit and then they have to go pick it up around Thanksgiving time. I, 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 I didn't really know that I needed make space until I read about them and I was like, wow, I, I really need that. So I think that's a great example. And, you know, do business leaders need to be concerned? Absolutely. Um, they have to be concerned so that a business like make space doesn't pop up and affect their business impact their bottom line and potentially put them out of business altogether. Um, you know, as some more examples, if we think about the last many years, the digital camera and film industry has changed so much old school retail versus e-commerce companies like borders, books, Payless, sports authority, you know, they're no longer around and Uber and Lyft, for example, I was perfectly happy with taxis. And now I can't get a taxi to save my life. And I live right downtown Chicago. So something that you didn't know you needed came up. At first, the idea seemed a little bit weird. Um, my friends were starting to talk about Uber and getting in a stranger's car. And I thought that was totally weird. And I, had, I didn't want anything to do with it. But now I use both Uber and Lyft regularly. So if you think of something that kind of comes up out of left field, might not seem like it's going to necessarily be successful but then all of a sudden it skyrockets and takes over the marketplace. Great, those are great examples. Thank you for sharing. And MakeSpace is wonderful. I totally agree. I've used <laughs> it as well. I'm glad it's working for you. Um, Brandon, from your experience, what is disruption and why are business leaders concerned with it? Uh, well, it's hard to follow Phyllis and, and her explanation, but I'm gonna try and layer on top of that. 
Um, disruption. So, you know, you can use that as a verb, you can use a noun, I suppose, a gerund. Disruption, really, I like to look at it a little bit differently. Step over to the side and think of disruption as anything unplanned. And if we, if we take it down to the micro level, we actually go through this every day. They're tiny micro disruptions. They're any kind of aberration, something unexpected. And we miss a lot of these. And they add up and they obscure the real disruption coming down the road. As Phyllis had mentioned, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the Airbnbs, the DoorDash. Now the micro disruptions, those are time consuming because we're just dealing with those all the time. The macros, because we miss them, we miss what's adding up. Those macros are life changing. They're career changing, career derailing. Sometimes they're industry end of life events. I do have on my list, besides going to this beach in Costa Rica, the last Blockbuster in Oregon, which you can rent as an Airbnb. Remember Blockbuster. So are we all going to come up with the next Slack, the next iPhone, the next Cyberpunk 27.7? Okay, that was a joke for everybody. Hopefully you don't come up with that next game. I would suggest that we all can, everybody on this call, everyone who's listening later, we can come up with, their, with that next disruption in our own niche, in our own company, in our own organization. And our takeaway from just this segment, I would say, let's focus on the micro disruptions, figure out what those indicate, and those lead us to those pending, looming macro disruptions that aren't even on our radar yet. Very good, that's awesome feedback, thank you. Paul, from your experience, what is disruption? Why are business leaders so concerned with it? Yeah, this is, I'm glad we started with this question because it leads into my answer for the second one. Um, you know, this is something that me and my colleagues live every day. Uh, there's a company called Twilio that everybody knows. Uh, this is a competitor of ours. Uh, back in 2015, 2016, we were three times the size of them. Uh, we were focused on the enterprise. Um, they were focused on the developer community. And so we got to not only witness, we got to get the impact of disruption. Um, you know, disrupting a telco industry that took you six to nine months to get a circuit provisioned, you could go do that within 30 minutes and spin up an API with Twilio uh, to send a voice call or an SMS anywhere in the world. So they made it so easy. They made it so easy to consume. It has just absolutely created its own category. So, you know, something that didn't exist in 2015 is now a, a $20 billion total addressable market. Um, so when you talk about leaders worrying about this type of disruption, um, it is catastrophic if uh, someone like this comes in and solves this type of a problem, just like Phyllis had touched upon, you know, the customers and the, and the developers and the IT uh, uh, administrators didn't know they had this need. Then they saw how easy they could implement this. And all of a sudden, you know, again, Tulio is one of the largest uh, success stories in, in Silicon Valley. Thanks, Paul. You each gave us lots of insights and, and different examples on disruption and, and why these business leaders are concerned with it. Um, you know, the next question is coming. But tell us a little bit about, in our next question, how can authentic customer engagement help companies avoid disruption? What does that look like and how does that work? Um, Brendan, why don't you start us off? Okay, thanks. Uh, I wasn't sure if Paul was going to keep on. It led naturally into his, so I didn't want to interrupt. Um, I'm building on that, focusing on the micros, the small things, as I see the chat and what folks are, are here for, what we're looking for, I would say that focusing on the micro, the, those interactions, even the ones where no human to human interaction takes place, focusing on what they mean. 90% of the time in leadership, we're focusing on 90% of the micros and not what they mean, what they indicate. What is it that's interrupting your customer's normal day-to-day -day life? Now this used to mean, why are they calling me? Why are they texting me? Why are they commenting on our company's social media? Now, what this may also mean is, why do they navigate away from the screen instead of purchasing? why do they come in our, our, our place of business, but leave without what, what they intended to purchase? Why did an internal transaction take five minutes instead of two minutes? And so what we need to do for customer engagement is look at the issue behind the issue not just human to human, but also automation, analysis, look at trends, and then proactive customer outreach to read between the lines and find out what are those micro disruptions for. That leads to our macro dis disruption and something we can do in our niche. 
in our company, in our organization, in our industry. And those little ones often, if we go back and we look at the history of these successful mega disruptors, they start with something that's just this small and they focused on it and they worked on it and that ended up disrupting the entire industry. Nice, I like that. Like micro disruption, disruptions. I don't, you don't hear too much about that language. I like the way you shared that, Brandon. Um, Paul, did you want to continue on your thought? Yes, really? yeah, so it does, it does segue. So I won't say that we avoided disruption. We got crushed with disruption. Um, and so we were flat revenue wise for two or three years and we're sitting there going, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? You know, they're going to 200,000, 300,000 customers. We sell point to point to the enterprise and authentic is the perfect word. Um, hire incredibly talented people, hire great culture people that resonates back into your customer. And so we looked at what we had to deal with and what we had to compete with. And we said, hey, we can't go be that developer community. We're going to go be who we are. We're going to be fan a fantastic company to be uh, to work with, a trusted partner. We're going to go in there and deliver solutions for our customer. We're going to give them white, treat white glove treatment on support uh, and engagement. And that is not how we avoided it. That's how we attacked it. Um, and because of that, you know, you have three years later, we're probably one of the fasting, fastest growing companies in the, in the industry next to the big behemoth. Yes, you guys are. <laughs> um, thank you, Paul. Um, Phyllis, why don't you share with us, can authentic customer engagement help companies avoid disruption? And if so, how? Yes, I, and I, I think, uh, you know, in my job in customer success, 90% of my job is listening. Um, but you can't just stop there. You listen to your customers. What are their goals, their challenges? Um, so you can help them anticipate their next need and, and fill it before someone else does. And, you know, I'll just give an example. I know that we're all tired of talking about COVID and the situation, but I, I think one of the positive things in working at Salesforce through COVID is um, it hit businesses hard and fast. It hit our customers. And we've got customers of all sizes around the globe. Some of them said, hey, you know, we lost 70% of our revenue. We can't pay you. How do we cancel our contract? And of course, we didn't want them to cancel their contract. Hopefully, they're going to bounce back at some point, and we still want them to be a customer. So we had to figure out really quickly how to help those customers. Then we also had customers who needed to transition to a remote workforce. And you might think, you know, a lot of us have our laptops in front of us. We're sitting at home. It's no big deal. But guess what? For a large call center, uh, who uses service cloud from Salesforce, it's a huge deal. They're telling those people who are used to coming in every single day to stay home and figure it out. And um, so we needed to come up with solutions fast to help these customers. And we had a group of developers who sat down for two weeks, figured out a solution, built a new product called work.com. And we got it right out there with our customers, tested it with them. And we ended up giving it away for, I want to say 90 days, um, for customers so that they could um, work remotely and also plan for bringing their troops back. You know, some have started that, many of us won't start that for a while, um, but thinking through, you know, if you have a thousand employees arriving at 8.30 in the morning or nine in the morning, how are you gonna get them all up the elevator and still stay, stay socially distant? So thinking through the problem that they're going to have, coming up with some, something quickly. And, you know, in order to do that, You've got to have the right leadership. You might have to have some funding saved to pivot immediately and serve that need very, very quickly. Um, you've got to listen to all of the employees who are out in the field talking directly to the customers so that you can react when something big comes up. And then not, and not only that, but you know, it's Salesforce. And so this offering is gonna turn into a paid offering at some point, even though we've offered it for free for a period of time to help people out. Um, and had we not done that, someone else would have done that. Plenty of others are doing that. So uh, again, it's a cultural thing, it's a leadership thing, it's having the funding ready to go so that you can move when your customers need you to move. Those are great examples. I love the adaptability, um, being change agile and focusing on the need, knowing that the revenue will, will follow. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, our next question is around Netflix. So in business circles and MBA programs, we tend to get bombarded with cautionary tales 
of great companies who failed in the face of disruption. And as you've all shared in this conversation today, uh, for companies and all of them, they, disruption has two facets. There's the potential threat to its activity, but also it's an opportunity to create new activities that are indispensable for its future growth. Netflix is a commonly referenced example of an industry disruptor that stole market share and transformed entertainment by delivering convenience to customers. If you worked for Netflix today, what strategies would you put in place to help them avoid being disrupted? Why don't we start with Paul? Well, first off, I, I couldn't wait for this question. I love Netflix. Um, uh, we're fortunate for a lot of the digital properties to be customers of ours. So it, it, to start with, I think Netflix is primed for disruption. What you've seen out of TikTok and what they've done to YouTube, I think Netflix is, is in this line of fire. Um, any one of us that have kids and multiple TVs uh, have to consistently peck and peck and peck to log on um, over and over and over. Um, the user experience is terrible. Um, they've got to improve their user experience. Um, whenever you look, I mean, Silicon Valley has some of the brightest data scientists in the world, but yet everything they serve you from a content standpoint is something you would never, never watch. Uh, my wife and I talked about this and it was like literally the only things we watch is what our friends say we should go watch because Netflix never has a very good recommendation for anything I want to watch. Um, and so again, they've been bringing great content, Cobra Kai specifically, um, but you know, again, that there's great content at Disney Plus, there's great content at Amazon Prime. What are they gonna do to differentiate? Um, and that's why I say the prime from disruption, because again, it, you can bring, you can continue to, to disrupt folks that aren't driving that type of user experience. I mean, how many times have you gone to Netflix and just said, I give up, I'm gone, right? I mean, I've done it all the time. And that's not good when you get into a highly, highly competitive marketplace that they have. So that would be the strategies I'd say, focus on their user experience, get the, get the data scientists to get the prop. I mean, they see everything you're watching. They should be able to do a better job of surfacing more content that you want to see. So um, that, those are my strategies that uh, would be forefront for me. Thanks, Paul. And thanks for the shout out for Cobra Kai there, which I think we, I haven't checked that out yet, but well, now I will. Um, and I think they used to have a recommendation engine. So I'm not sure what changed, what changed there, but um, Phyllis, can you share with us what strategies would you put in place to help Netflix be uh, disrupted? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with, with what was just said. I think focusing on the user experience, testing, watching the metrics. Um, it, you know, in, in the old days, we would invite people in and sit behind the, the mirror looking wall and watch how they used it. And of course, the stupid users were not using it right. <laughs> you know, we'd ask them to talk out loud about what was frustrating them. And um, once our egos you know, Bruce Ego got over it, then we would put a plan in place to meet the needs of those users. So I think that's great. Also, I think Netflix has to challenge themselves to become the disruptor again. So you've got to have staff who are consistently analyzing the environment, your competitors, the needs of the customer, and, and challenge themselves to disrupt again. You know, they did it, they did it once. Um, what's the next idea going to be? And I think they've done a good job of getting Netflix only content out there, you know, producing their own shows and things like that. So that um, you might put up with the experience if you love one of the series that's out there and then the next season comes and comes. Um, so they just need to continue to challenge themselves to do it again. Great. The, the other thing I'm thinking is, um, you know, if a disruptor pops up, sometimes you gotta be ready to just buy them. And, you know, working for Salesforce, we've got a team constantly looking at a list of companies that we could buy. And we're, we're poised and ready to make a purchase when the time is, has come, research is ongoing. Um, you know, if you think back to, we'll pick on Blockbuster, you know, um, Dish Network acquired the remaining assets in 2011. So they got all the customer lists. And then they started shutting down all the stores, except the one in Bend, Oregon. And I wanna go to that one too. Um, so think about, you know, what you can buy and then finally diversify the business, you know, Salesforce started 22 years ago with the CRM product. And if we would have just stayed and focused on being the best CRM in the cloud, we would have been in trouble. You know, we had to keep our eyes open and realize that there were synergies with other business areas, you know, like once 
you've got the customer's name and contact information and you've sold to them, guess what? Now they need customer service. Oh, now you do sales and service. Great. That's awesome. Guess what? Don't you want to market to those people to expand uh, your share and get them to buy some more? Well, you know, so we expanded to a marketing solution and the list goes on and on and on. So, you know, maybe think about diversifying the business in case the Netflix of today, for whatever reason, dies, then what are you going to do so that the company still exists and continues on? Love that. Disrupt yourself. Brandon, if you worked for Netflix today, what strategies would you put in place to help them avoid being disrupted? We, we do not have enough time to tackle this subject. Um, you know, essentially, here's the question, right? How can Netflix in the next 18 months to five years compete with Amazon, Hulu, and most importantly, Baby Yoda, right? So the industry's on it. Can I ask, can anybody who has Netflix just chat a why or a yes? Who has a Netflix subscription? Okay, I don't want to shame anybody. If anybody has access to a Netflix subscription, let's, let's do that. I want to know, am I the only Netflix, Netflix lover on here? Oh my gosh, just got flooded with it. Okay, now, if anybody has, because <laughs> the, 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 the statements that Phyllis and Paul said are so true. Has anybody canceled their Netflix and successfully not gone back to it, but just stopped, but stopped it? Okay, you got it free, that still counts. Has anybody canceled? I've canceled it, I've tried, I've tried to break the habit, but I've come back. Has anybody, if you have, can you put like a, a C for cancel? If you've canceled it and stayed away. Okay, one person. Oh, you did drop yours, okay. So it's interesting, I wanna, I wanna so you couldn't stay away. Okay. <laughs> I want to address that. That's actually the, my third option. So first of all, I wouldn't work for Netflix, but I would consult with them just because of the meat grinder. Uh, so the third thing is actually, how do we educate our viewers? I, I came home and uh, my, my kid's mom had said one time, this is a, a, a long time ago, I've watched everything. And I said, what do you mean you watched everything? And it was, well, I've watched everything that's come up. And I said, well, here, let me, let's get on, let's go on, get online. And what shows do you like? Let's look them up and see what other people recommend. Here you go. If you start going down this road, then all of a sudden I watched, I watched one uh, Indian uh, Hindi language um, epic. And all of a sudden I'm flooded with them. I watched one South Korean drama and now I'm flooded with them. So you have to get in there. How do we educate people without making them feel upset? Okay, Netflix Direct. Apparently this is out in France already and it's, it's a streaming option where you can put it on and you can just see, they're just gonna feed you stuff. And the idea is to try and expose us, the viewer, to things that you might normally not because they have found from analysis that just, just showing it on there as a preview of, of just a thumbnail, hey, and you can, you can select it on your Roku or on your smart TV and, or whatever you have and, and just let it run for 30 seconds. It's not hooking people as much as old school TV where it's just broadcasting them. And so they're trying this. Now that's the third choice. My, my first one, I wanna go back to what should Netflix do? You only have two choices. You can raise the monthly, raise the monthly subscription and my, mine has been raised by a dollar once in a while, but <laughs> I never cancel. I stay because that dollar is worth it to me when I break it down, a dollar divided by 30 days. So you can raise the monthly description or increase the number of viewers. So let's, let's increase the number of viewers. Real quick, live events, remember those? We used to go to live events. I have my tickets for LA football club, soccer team, and my FC Davis uh, Women's Professional Soccer League got rolled over to this year. And unless enough people get jabbed in the arm to get rolled over to next year too, I don't think Netflix can compete with the mouse, with ESPN, with BN Sports, things like that. How about teaming up with major studios to get more eyeballs and more people subscribe? Nope, they passed on James Bond, it was too much money. Barat, whoosh, just went right past them. How about more shows? Please, you guys have already pointed out, they're cranking them out by the digital boatload. Cobra Kai, Queen's Gambit, you name it. These are great shows. We talked about Netflix Direct, which is, is, is prototyping in France. Okay, at first I thought, this UG, you're gonna force me to watch whatever's on, like back in the olden days when I had to go on my TV. Does anybody remember that? And the TV that sat in the floor, my parents had? Nope. Actually, I started thinking, going, wow, instead of just boosting numbers because they're forcing it, they'd introduce me to them. So I may have to VPN to France to try this out. Okay, <laughs> here's some new ideas. Boosting foreign shows. 
I know, I know. I have friends who say, I don't do subtitles. Netflix is dubbing everything. They're dubbing them. So you can watch your favorite Danish crime, uh, tr- crime drama. Those, that's a whole genre, by the way, for shows from Denmark. You can watch whatever you want out of um, uh, that's Tamil language and Telugu language. You can watch whatever you want, and they can be dubbed. So those of us that don't want to read it because we just want to veg, you can do that. Here's another thing. A lot of discussion online, a weekly drop. Instead of dropping all of Cobra Kai, what if it's one a week? And now you get that water cooler, that Slack, Zoom, Salesforce chatter. You're, 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 uh, did I say it right, Phyllis? You're, you're talking with your, with your teammates and your colleagues about it. There you go. Where does that come back to? It comes back to better customer experience, listening, analyzing that direct version, that dubbing, and the weekly drop. And then finally, advertise where the eyeballs are. Figure out where it is and advertise, not just Netflix, but advertise, try this. Did you know Netflix now dubs 85% of, of, of shows that are not in, in, in your language? And by your language, I often go on and there's 30 or more languages to choose from. I really only speak Southern California and, um, and just American English. Uh, I get lost in some of the Scottish and some of the accents. So I, I'm limited in that. But I think that's where we are is micro focusing in order to macro disrupt. Brandon. You, you probably need to consult with them because you have so many great ideas that you've clearly thought through. <laughs> uh, well, to be, to be quite, quite fair and transparent, people much smarter than me have posted all this online. So the first thing I did was go out and, and read and then think about it and then try and dive into it. Um, and I'm a heavy Netflix user. I, I probably watch, uh, you know, a number of hours a week because I just, it's, it's, I mean, how can you beat the Queen's Gambit, Cobra Kai, uh, you know, so many great shows. And if you, if you d- dive into the foreign language programming, um, there is just a whole world out there uh, that is just really enjoyable. Thank you for sharing. I was just checking through the chat and a lot of good points as well. Um, Angela shared uh, similar to Brandon, how there's a plethora of great content out there. So how do you choose? But I, I still... I still have Netflix. Um, Kelly shared that her account was hacked last year, but um, lost a lot of her history and recommendations and lists, things that they could shore up there. So uh, things at the feature function level, things at the user experience level, um, things to stay ahead of the market. Great feedbacks. All right. So I think we have uh, one final question before we move on to the audience questions. So our younger generations will eventually take the reins and become our future leaders. If you were a mentor to a recent graduate that hopes to pursue a career as an entrepreneur, what, t- what tips would you provide them about identifying a market opportunity? Phyllis, can you share with us? Sure. I mean, I think first you need to do your research. You need to find a need in the marketplace that is not being met or that is being met really poorly. And you have an idea that's going to revolutionize the customer experience. And so I think the make space example I just gave is one of them. Um, You know, food for thought, Salesforce, uh, this, this ecosystem at Salesforce is amazing. And it's, it's nothing like anywhere I ever worked before I came to Salesforce. You know, it's a huge company, many software products and services, but we're not all things to all people. And so there are tons of examples of needs that our customers have that we don't meet ourselves. Um, we, you know, we let them post out in our idea exchange, things that they want to have in the products. Um, but I do know that this has happened over and over. Someone works at Salesforce. They see a need in the marketplace. They leave Salesforce. They go start their own startup. Sometimes Salesforce even invests in those startups. And then, as you can imagine, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but we have been known to then, once they get really big and successful and almost come to start to compete with us, we buy them. So we have a lot of people working at Salesforce who are boomerang, that they started out here, they left started their own company, you know, and so my point there is, you know, you don't have to work to work at Salesforce necessarily. Maybe you go to work at a big corporation and that's where you learn that business so well. You're talking to customers, you figure out there's a need and there's no way that that company you're working for can move fast enough 
or that they're maybe willing to do a startup or start a new service line. I mean, I think those are opportunities you can find that you're not taking a huge chance. You've already validated that they exist. Uh, an example of this is, you know, we're going to close on an acquisition of Velocity uh, plan for June 1st. And Velocity provides industry specific cloud software. So, you know, we're only 22 years old. Have we, have we had the opportunity at Salesforce to build a specific vertical in the cloud for every single industry that exists? No, we haven't. We've built a couple and now we're going to buy it. We're going we're gonna to buy the rest of them. So, you know, food for thought there. Nice. Congratulations. Um, Brandon, can you share with us what tips you would provide recent graduates about identifying a market opportunity? Well, this is a this is a difficult one because we all want to follow our passion. At the same time, it's what does it take to live. Um, you can be passionate about tacos, which I am, and if you want to know, the best ones are in South LA, off of 110, off of Slauson. It's a tire shop that has a truck permanently parked and dueling pastor spits. Um, I've got a list. No matter where you are, uh, we love to just look for tacos. Um, but I don't know that I could make a living off of something where I tried to disrupt the taco industry. So you got to kind of balance those out. Um, something I tell my almost 20 year old, and I think he's latched onto it is, um, you can be passionate about things, but make sure you put a roof over your head. And so if you want to, to find a market opportunity, balance those out, research, connect with people. This is a great place. I hope we all flood each other with LinkedIn connections that say, hey, I was on and we, we all talked about Netflix so that we know who you are, make that connection and ask micro focus. What is this something that you're interested in and micro focus? How does it exist today and how can it be better? And I, I think that it is possible to have those two circles merge and overlap, uh, but it takes a lot of focus. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Paul, what tips would you provide recent graduates about identifying a market opportunity? One of my favorite uh, topics is I've, I've been in four startups. Uh, I think it's a, an old movie called Back to School and it's called uh, Don't Do It, Stay in School. It's really hard out there. Um, <laughs> um, pl plenty. And I think, I think Phyllis and Brandon nailed it. Um, research, research, research. Um, I, I, and that doesn't mean like a college project and, you, and after three weeks you've, you've got all the data and you're ready to go. I mean, this could take years. The, you're going to go up into a market where there are people like Salesforce and Oracle and, and these the smartest, brightest people walking the planet. Um, so it's not just about a great idea. It's again, you know, a lot of what they said, identifying the market fit, the gap in the market, um, doing a, a ton of research. The data is out there, right? You can find a lot of market data, pay for a lot of market data. Um, I was at an Andreessen Horowitz startup and the, the founder literally did over 100 interviews of people in the customer experience, customer engagement community. Um, you know, she didn't know if she was going to write a book about it. She didn't know what she was going to do with it. And she was like, well, wait a minute, there's a huge gap here. I'm going to start a company and build a platform. Um, so, you know, again, you've really got to identify that market opportunity. There's so many brilliant people globally, um, all looking to solve all different kinds of problems. That doesn't mean there's not an opportunity for you. I mean, look at, look at some of the most amazing uh, innovations that have happened even in the last 12 to 24 months that have exploded that, that you would have never would have, would have made any thought would have made any difference. Um, the other thing I would say for anybody coming right out of college that has very entrepreneurial aspirations, I would tell them to go find a series A startup. Um, there is nothing better than cutting your teeth. And as Brandon said, keeping a roof over your head um, but seeing how hard it is, seeing how important it is to hire really talented people that are not only talented, but fantastic from a culture perspective that collaborate so that you really understand what it takes to build a team. Uh, because when you want to bring this idea to market and you start building your own team, you're going to have to really understand that one bad apple can ruin the bunch. You're going to have to understand that no one has a specific job title. Um, you know, whenever I was at Telesign, I was the 11th employee. Some of us, some of us would take the trash out. Um, and I was head of sales. Okay, great. Hey, the trash is there. Can you make sure it hits the bin? Um, so again, it's a wonderful time. It's your most cherished memories uh, in your career, but is by far the hardest thing because it's trial by fire and you're literally learning as you go. Um, so, uh, you know, for those entrepreneurial people, I'd say get into a startup. I'd say 
to talk to, to, you know, the amazing thing about when I was younger in my career is I'm so afraid of those people with those big titles and, and at the big companies and all these types of people. But if you have something interesting and you can provide value to a conversation or what have you, people really, I mean, people, senior level people really want to help others. They really do. It's just, in, unless you're just a bad citizen and I, I, I won't go there, but like in, inherently we want to help. And so if there's topics, if they're a college kid that reaches out to me, I want to talk to them. I want to, I want to see what they're, what they're digging up. What are you researching? What are you looking at? Um, and see if it's a problem that I've encountered. Um, so it, to me, that's the kind of fun stuff that technology brings and innovation brings. Um, and uh, again, all topics that I'm very passionate about because I, I love the startup community. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the world has been built by this type of entrepreneur coming out of, of college and, and wanting to solve a huge problem or, or, or be in charge of their own destiny or start their own company. It's just, uh, it's, it's a very exciting thing. Great insights, Paul. Thank you so much. There's so many options out there and joining a young startup is one way. Uh, thinking about how to be an entrepreneur within an organization, and I think is another um, really great stuff and love the, love the motivation and passion you all share. Um, looking at the time, I think we're about ready for some audience questions. Um, do we have any in the chat? Let's take a look. Some may have been posted to our other hosts. Let's see. Well, here's one. Um, let's see. So we've spent a lot of time talking about external client customers. What is the role of internal customer employee in support of company growth? Brandon? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. So if you look on LinkedIn, you'll see my, my employer who I'm very happy with. And so um, I just not drop in the name, uh, but uh, in my role for the past few years there, I've done that exact, I've answered that exact question is how do we, how do we improve it internally? And it really starts with, I know we're getting tired of this word, but micro focusing on things. It takes what Paul mentioned of going out and interviewing, talking with a lot of internal employees, internal customers and figure out, okay, what's the pain points? Uh, my, my, my big boss has a great saying, it's the silent suffers people that are not happy inside the company with the support you're giving them inside the company. So if you're in human resources, legal sales, uh, support development, you've got internal customers there and talking to them and saying, Hey, I realize things might not be the way you'd like them to. What, what are some things we could do and focusing? It doesn't seem like much, but things that are this small turn out to be major internal disruptors in a positive way. They improve productivity. They make your fellow employees happy. They, in turn, help the sales team. They help the, the accounting team, the billing team. They help them bring in more revenue. And so there's a lot of things because our internal customers, our internal fellow employees, if we just focus on those little things, don't try and, don't try and eat the whole world. Just focus on that sweet little sweet taco. Back to tacos. I'm getting hungry. It's lunchtime. I have to. It's, it's one of those, you know, I can picture them now. Phyllis, do you have some thoughts to share? What is the role of an internal, internal customer or employee in support of company growth? Yeah, one thing came to mind and it's a little bit micro. There you go, Brandon. Um, it, it doesn't exactly answer the question, but what, what came to mind, um, we've, got a, we've got a collaboration system as part of our software that we constantly use. We hardly use email at all. And we, we live out there um, and it's called chatter. Um, we have chatter groups specifically for, you know, who do I call is one of them. It's a huge company now all of a sudden, and we don't know everybody and I'm trying to serve my client. We've got a problem. Who do I call for something? And that's assigned to be monitored by specific groups. We also have two other groups one is called something like shout it from the rooftop rooftop so it's meant to be hey this is great i love working here and here's why and shout something positive positive. and we also have the opposite and the name of it is drawing a blank right now but if you want to bitch about something we're, we're giving you uh, a channel to do that and that is also monitored 
So um, I think you've got to be careful sometimes. I, I see things out there once in a while that maybe I would not have recommended posting, um, but they do get attention. Uh, another thing I'm thinking of is, you know, we have town hall meetings with our executives now since COVID started on a weekly basis. And I know that, you know, it, the chatter group for that session is open several days before the meeting. And I have posted, you know, a problem that I had with the client and who, who can I talk to about this issue? And it, it didn't get addressed during the session, but someone who reported to the CEO called me. So I knew he was watching it. He had a meeting with me and all his vice presidents and said, okay, how do we help this client? So I think just making it okay to raise ideas, to raise challenges, and then making sure, you know, once you ask people to ask their question or, you know, give you their opinion, you're just setting an expectation for a response. So if you don't respond to it, you're going to lose trust. So you've got to, you've got to have the system and the program set up so that you're going to get responses. Great feedback. Thanks for sharing those um, Salesforce uh, products and, and offerings internally too. Those are, those are great examples that we don't think we would normally hear about. Um, Paul, I know Telesign is really dedicated to um, employee growth. What, what is the role of uh, employee support in company growth? Gosh, it's everything. Um, I know it's, I, I know it's, um, but boy, it, it's, a, it's a very broad uh, subject. Um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to grow during the pandemic. I think that it's just been so challenging, the political environment, the pandemic, you roll all these things into things that we've never seen in our generation. And, and what I've seen out of our employees is again, just, uh, you know, you needing to give them unwavering support. And, and as Phyllis had, had outlined, you know, uh, Salesforce, you know, giving that type of accessibility, given, given the employees that voice, that's what we've been trying to do across the board, across teams, um, you know, our typical sales meetings, our typical pipeline reports, you know, we're opening them up for forums and, and things like that. What's not job related? What's what's customer related? Like just especially when you go to the Zoom environment, um, how do you stay accessible? And again, we're not the size and scale of a, of a sales force, but, you know, you're still talking about 30 or 40 people um, on, on these specific teams or in this region uh, getting on these calls, but literally weekly staying accessible um, you know, surfacing these questions, opening it up, um, you know, when people have had offline conversations, you know, pointing to them and say, hey, you had a great topic, bring it up to the team. Um, just again, overall support. When you talk about growth, um, you know, this is something uh, as our leadership team, we spend a lot of time discussing weekly, actually, of, again, what's, what's things we can do for the company? What's ways we can think of, of changing it up? And we have fantastic op people operations leadership within TeleSign. And, you know, when something really bad happens, the email goes out immediately. Hey, if this is just a too, if this is just a little too much for everyone to handle today, please step away, take a day. You know, get 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 your mental health in a good place. Um, and again, just trying to to put your employees uh, first. Uh, um, so, you know, I think that a lot of the growth mechanism we haven't focused in as much as we've tried to you know, really ensure that we're making it a great place to work, that we're making it open and accessible um, uh, to all employees. Um, and, and then again, continuing to message and communicate out our full support. Um, back to the people operations people, uh, things that we've done, they've gotten crazy creative on, I mean, we've had Lego contests, we've had cooking contests, we've had, so I, I stick to the internal, but I have to say this, this turns into growth because it turns into team growth and team collaboration um, because we're not just doing, you know, 10 hours of Zoom calls every day, calling it a day and then rinse and repeat and starting again the next morning. So, um, you know, it's those types of things being creative uh, during this type of environment, um, collaborating across teams, opening, you know, keeping those communication lines, open that I think um, has really led to our success and, and, you know, minimal to no attrition during a, you know, a really difficult time for everyone when you're still trying to actually do the job and, and hit your numbers, right? Absolutely. It's great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more good questions here. So just kind of open it up. Let's see. We've got Jackie wrote Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb built business models around unused assets. Are there other unused assets that could be put to use and disrupt an industry? Yes. Tell us, tacos. 
<laughs> uh, well, let's let's look real quick because there are other questions too. Um, so, Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb, um, in 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 a, a person, not a company, but a person's lifetime, the two big expenses that are tangible are your home and your car. Uh, uh, going to college, those kind of loans, those are not tangible ones that we can we can hold on to. And so, look at what other tangible things are out there. Something off the cuff that comes to mind is parking lots. I know it sounds crazy, but think about what kind of events, reoccurring events can happen half hour, off hours in a parking lot that would generate a little bit of revenue for that parking lot owner. So it might be a private business that has a large parking lot. I attend a farmer's market down here in Orange County. It's on a parking lot of a huge church every Saturday. They give that to them, but there are other things that could happen. There are events that could happen on a repetitive basis that those owners could generate money from. And there's opportunity for a startup there to match them up, to do the, to do the hustle. If we go down, you know, look at micro things, look at what the, the scooter, the, uh, you know, Uber took over, Bird, uh, Lime, all the different ones of scooters. When you start getting down to that level, it's a little harder, right? You're gonna say, well, what about loaning out your laptop? What about loaning out your, your kitchen equipment? It gets a little bit harder because there's a lot of, a lot, it's, it's, it's fiddly. There's a lot of little things that can go wrong there. There's a lot of, of, of cost in those and, and fixing those. But I would say there's definitely unused assets that are out there that are just waiting for, for someone to come up with the idea, to talk to people, to do like Paul said, do the hustle and talk to the business owners and say, hey, I've noticed you've got this huge parking lot here that nobody's here Monday through Friday because you're a weekend business or nobody's here after hours because you're, you're a day business. Would you ever think about renting it out? You don't need to do a whole business plan to have some quick conversations. And that's just one thing that just came off the cuff. There you go, someone else just jumped in. Renting out your pool for an hourly rate. Um, you know, my dream job for many years and, and probably still is in the back is, is having a, a kayak rental place on the beach uh, in, in, in uh, Central America with a smoothie stand beside it. You know, it's small, it's, it's micro, it's not big, but is there always gonna be a need for this? There is. That's why I binged watch Nicaraguan videos the other night looking for the right place on the Pacific coast. Love it. So see where opportunity lies. Uh, Phyllis yeah. or Paul, would you like to share? I love, I love the renting out the pool area. There was, uh, there was people that we worked with at other companies that went over there to lead product uh, from Airbnb. Airbnb is a customer of ours. Um, it was just brilliant because they talked about, um, how high a percentage of lack of usage pools have once uh, the kids get into college, once the kids get into high school and what have you. And then you have empty nesters that literally the pool is never used. And so renting it out for $150 for an hour or for $300 for three hours um, when they're not there and they have to clean it up, who cares? Um, so it's actually, it's pretty interesting sharing, sharing economy model. Um, that's that's one I'm very privy to because uh, we we know the folks there, um, but but yeah, I mean again, I I don't think I have a lot to add. I think Brandon covered it uh, uh, completely. <laughs> yeah, and the thing that comes to mind for me, and I, I love the pool thing. I I wish my a neighbor had a pool here in Chicago <laughs> that I could go rent for an hour um, in the summer. Um, but it, I'm thinking about real estate right now. You know, I've got some corporate real estate customers and they've lost 70% of their revenue through COVID. Um, so is there something that could be done in the big office buildings where you're still socially distanced for some time? Cause that business we expect will come back, you know, it's going to take some time to come back, but is there something different that can be done there? Um, another real estate related idea is that Macy's, which is the flagship of the magnificent mile in Chicago is closing. And I think we've heard enough in the news about retail and e-commerce and, you know, COVID people aren't shopping and stuff. So it's really shaken, you know, the, the Chicago community. Um, and so what I've seen at places, I'm originally from Minnesota. So I've been to Mall of America many times a year for uh, probably since it was created when I go up to see my family. And when the Mall of America started to lose some of their flagship anchor stores, they're turning them into event spaces. So there's something called the Crayola experience that went in where Bloomingdale's used to be, something like that. 
Um, Sears has, you know, has been um, reducing their footprint at Mall of America. I used to work for Sears as well in e-commerce, so I'm familiar with that business. Um, in retail in general, you know, those spaces are becoming something else. They're becoming gyms, and you're starting to see, if you go to the mall, um, you're starting to see some different things in there versus what you would have seen 20 years ago. So just, just some thoughts. Great stuff. Thank you. Those are great examples. Beth shared a little bit in, in the chat that it seems nowadays it's more possible to disrupt within an already existing company. Um, just going on to say often large corporations without having to create a startup, uh, that disruption can happen within a project, within an initiative. And then another observation, um, I, I think more for entrepreneurs, whatever you feel you can offer, go for it. And sometimes you have to start at the bottom and work your way up. You'll learn along the way. Oh, can I add in here, Shelly? Absolutely. So uh, something that tickled my head there when Phyllis was, was sharing is that, um, you know, as, as we, as we come out of COVID, you know, this year, this year and six months and 12 months can be different than it was six months ago. There's all these opportunities. Uh, a friend of mine shared the idea that um, she had uh, over a year ago before, before we got hit with all this of creating a, a custom outdoor dining experience for couples for anniversaries and Valentine's day and birthdays, but just two people real small. And um, they, she did a trial run on it, uh, I think with her boyfriend, and in a park, put it up, card table, white cloth, chairs, and she and he sat down and ate, you know, charcuterie and wine and everything. And couples kept coming over to him saying, excuse me, I'm sorry, what, what, what is this? And, he's, and, and, and I, I guess her boyfriend just said, well, we do this for a living. They were just kind of playing with people. And they said, do you have a card? How much does it cost? And her boyfriend literally said, well, it's about 500 bucks is, my, is, is what it costs. And the person said, okay, they did not have a business. That was just him goofing around. And so they then talked afterwards and they were gonna launch this and COVID happened. I believe they're gonna try later this year to launch it again. Because once you have those, those, those few fixed items, the rest is just food you're picking up from Whole Foods and plating it. Um, and so there's a lot out there. And just as turning uh, retail space, corporate space into something that's usable, parking lots, rooftop parking into cinema, different things. There's things that are gonna open up week after week uh, this year, I do believe. And you know, looking out towards next year, even more so. So there's so much out there. Awesome. There is a business like that that exists in Chicago. So I've seen a lot of big parties. I see them setting up, they come in, you know, in their car and they keep walking back and forth to the park and setting up a low table. And then the party comes. And it, you know, hopefully some face masks are still there, <laughs> but yeah, if you're, if you're young and scrappy and you're willing to just go for it, I, you know, someone said that in the comments, um, do it, see if you can grow it. Yeah. If not, it'll help get you by in the, in the meantime. Well, uh, Paul, Phyllis, Brandon, each of you has been incredibly inspiring today. I want to thank each of you for your contributions. Uh, these are really great things. I think we see all the creativity that's come in a challenging time. Um, thanks to all the participants. Um, Brian, I'll hand this over to you for closing, but really want to thank everyone for joining us in this first session of Business Bites. Um, appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Shelly. But yeah, thank you again to the panelists. That was such an amazing and an insightful conversation between everyone. And I really think the entire audience really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, during this time, there's a lot of things happening. So I'm glad that we can share knowledge within each other. Um, I'm gonna drop in the survey link uh, into the chat and then we'll also be sending out the recording via email and on our YouTube channel as well. So yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Please have a wonderful rest of your day and wonderful rest of the week and a very late uh, happy new year to everyone once again.